What exactly makes the original Teen Titans so appealing? Is it the fight scenes, the scenery, the bad guys and their motivations, or could the show's success connect directly to the heroes and their unique personalities and powers? Today, these heroes' personalities will be put to the test as their inner thoughts reveal just how heroic each of them really is. I'm Brad from Wicked Binge, and this is Teen Titan Heroes, least good to most good. Teen Titans. But first, we gotta get through the rules. One, we're only using the series. Therefore, comics and alternate versions of these characters not found in the show will not be factored in. Two, since some of the characters offer far more or less information than others, we're factoring in which actions stand out the most. And three, since there are cases where characters are brainwashed or controlled against their will, we're not factoring in these actions, since the character themselves did not actively make the choices in question. All right, let's get Get started with the least heroic and work our way up. It pains us to say, but the worst hero is Terra. At first, she tried to use her powers for good, but as Slade explains, each time ended with Terra causing accidents due to her lack of control. While staying with the team, Terra starts to gain confidence in herself thanks to Beast Boy's support, which gives her a sense of hope. However, things quickly go downhill when she thinks Beast Boy told Robin about her lack of control, even when he promised her he wouldn't. This misunderstanding causes her to to run to Slade for help. The only one she seems to hesitate hurting is Beast Boy, since the two ended up going on a date when the ambush on the Titan's tower is put into action, which by the way, she was completely aware of. By the end of the night, she does feel guilty and tries to tell him the truth. Unfortunately, the damage was done and couldn't be taken back. After this, she turns into a true villain. She swears loyalty to Slade, willingly attacks her former friends, and uses their weaknesses to her advantage. She breaks Overload, Cinderblock, and Plasmas out of jail so Slade can control them, and she even conquered the entire city, claiming to have no regrets of doing so. However, when she disobeys her master and receives a punishment for doing so, she turns on Slade. With encouragement from Beast Boy, she not only succeeds in killing Slade, but she also stopped a massive volcano before the lava destroys the entire city. This action causes her to be petrified in stone. In the episode, Things Change, we see Terra again. From her body language and actions, it's clear that Terra is lying about having no memory of the past. Terra has shown signs of being a noble hero, but she has also shown signs of being a merciless villain as well. She chose to become a figure of terror and use her powers to serve a true villain, and for that reason, she gets the medal for the worst hero. Our second nastiest hero is Valyor. He's an outstanding hero who agrees to take on an entire army of artificial intelligent beings that want to destroy all organic beings in the universe by himself. This includes going on a suicide mission which is entering their home planet and shutting them down for good. His bravery and noble efforts are definitely admirable, even to the Titans, which tag along to help. Unfortunately, Valyor is racist towards Starfire. He yells at her when she's trying to help him, he subtly mocks her in front of her friends, throws her mistakes in her face, and sees her as nothing but a nuisance on the mission. Even after he gets trapped in a force field, he would rather die than take Starfire's hand after she's able to pry the field open. Despite the fact that she just saved his life, he still continues to treat her poorly, and when her friends stand up for her, he turns his back on them as well. Now, we have the leader of the Doom Patrol, Minto. On one hand, he wants to protect the world from the leader of the Brotherhood of Evil, the Brain, and is willing to do anything necessary to achieve this goal. He tends to put his need to stop the Brain above the safety of his own team, including Beast Boy. This is made worse when we're told that the Doom Patrol is family to Minto. Protecting the planet is a noble deed, but sacrificing those who matter the most to him is definitely a cause of conflict on his morality, especially since he gets angry at Beast Boy for choosing his friend's safety over stopping the villain. Thankfully, Beast Boy is able to convince Minto that working towards both goals can lead to a victorious outcome. We do have to give the guy some credit. He reveals later on that he doesn't want the Titans involved, because he doesn't want them to follow the same oath that the Doom Patrol took. 
and he also confesses that he does care for his own team, as he and Beast Boy have an argument. But the biggest moment of his morality shines through when he's able to trust Beast Boy and follow his plan, which, thanks to both teams, works out perfectly. Next, we have Speedy. We first meet Speedy in the episode Winner Takes All, where he fights Robin, Aqualad, and Wildebeest. In this episode, he acts respectful towards Robin and Wildebeest, as he offers considerable words to both of them. However, he doesn't show the same courtesy to Aqualad during their fight, since he laughs at the other hero for getting zapped by his lasers. On the other hand, he shows support during the rest of the episode by asking Robin if winning was worth the damage done, helping the fellow hero to save the others from the Game Master, and even forgives Robin for the teen's competitive nature. In fact, his biggest deed of heroism comes from the episode for real, when he saves the city from missiles, using himself as a bow. Otherwise, we don't really see much of him being a hero. In fact, the guy is more of a hothead than Hotspot has proven to be, figuratively speaking, of course. Up next is Robot Man from the Doom Patrol. For being a robot, this guy definitely has an attitude. He's demanding, rowdy, rude, and acts like a big shot when he has to follow orders from the Titans. That being said, he does show some good qualities. He's supportive of Beast Boy and looks after him as such. He protects his team to the best of his abilities, and he does show great care for them as well, especially after he learns that they were captured by the Brotherhood of Evil. When push comes to shove, he doesn't even mind putting his own life at risk, just to give the team some time to continue on their missions. Speaking of which, we now have Negative Man, who's also a member of Doom Patrol. Unfortunately, we don't get to see too much of him compared to the other members of the team. He succeeds in destroying the brain's black hole generator, and he saves Robot Man from getting stuck in quicksand. But his biggest heroic deed is when he nearly gets himself killed battling minds that the General created, in order to make sure that the rest of his team is able to stop the Brotherhood of Evil. To be frank, since his soul can separate itself from his body, he must feel as empty as his voice most of the time. Next up is Elastigirl. She's one of the members of Doom Patrol, who's been trying to stop the Brotherhood of Evil from the beginning, just like the rest of her team. She has taken down armies of soldiers by herself, and she can definitely hold her own in battle. She offers advice from the heart, and is willing to put herself in jeopardy to help those closest to her, such as when she tries to break out of prison for Mento's sake, or when she pushes Beast Boy out of the way of a falling rock. Needless to say, she has a big heart underneath her tough face. She's marked very low on the list due to the oath that she took as a member of Doom Patrol. Up next on her list is the leader of Titans East, Bumblebee. Let's start off with her questionable actions. She was actively part of the Hive Academy, which is a school for supervillains. So, in Wavelength, she's seen helping Brother Blood by sending enemies to attack the Titans, fighting against them herself, and even helping the bad guy build his underwater headquarters. Even though she was revealed to be a spy, this leaves us to wonder what other actions she committed while trying to get close to this guy. Her need to prove herself also causes her to lash out, particularly at Aqualad and Silky, when Titans East are left in charge of Titans Tower. Since she was undercover, Bumblebee helps Cyborg to destroy Brother Blood's newest invention before the device floods the entire city. And she also succeeds in getting the half-robot's blueprints back from the Madman. She and Aqualad form Titans East to protect Steel City from Brother Blood, and when her team is left in charge of the original Titan City, she takes the job very seriously. Bumblebee even lends a hand during the fight with the Brotherhood of Evil, as she's seen fighting Punk Rocket and another former Hive Academy student. Her involvement with Brother Blood is the only thing that keeps her placement from being more of a hero on the list. We move on to the first main Titan, Raven. Raven is definitely not a people person, considering how impatient, rude, and sarcastic she is. Though, she can't really be held at fault for this, since we discover in the episode Switched that her emotions drive her powers. So, the more feelings she shows, the more dangerous her powers get. However, her refusal to show her emotions does get the better of her at times. For instance, when she tries to act like Cyborg leaving the team doesn't bother her, this causes her powers to break the computer monitor she was working on. Another example can be found in the episode Fear Itself, when she denies being afraid, which causes her powers to turn 
turn the tower into a living nightmare for the team. Her bad people skills can be seen towards almost everyone, including allies, enemies, and her friends. For one, after Terra joins the team, she still doesn't fully trust her, and the two get into a few arguments as a result. For two, she doesn't make the best impression with Melvin and the other kids, as she quickly gets annoyed with them. Even though all these actions are minor, the big reason why Raven is so low on this list is due to the fact that she fulfilled her birth prophecy which allowed her father to end all of life on Earth and nearly caused the whole galaxy to fall under his control. Ugh, yikes. Thankfully, she does reverse the damage, and life goes on peacefully. On that note, Raven does show some good qualities. Since she doesn't like bickering, she's usually the voice of reason in the group and the one most willing to listen to others. This can be seen in the episode Car Trouble, when she offers comfort and support to Cyborg over his car being stolen, and also gives him closure in the episode episode Cyborg the Barbarian. We also see her offering a peaceful solution for the team in the episode Go and watching Starfire's back in the episode Switched. Despite all the grief that he gives her, Raven always does what she can to keep Beast Boy out of trouble. She's even willing to act as bait in order to find him and every dog has his day. In the episode Titans Rising, she gets angry at Terra for not listening to her, since the Earth Wielder's actions almost put her friends in danger, hence the reason why she says, but you're not part of this team, not yet. And if you ever endanger my friends again, you never will be. The next time I tell you something's too dangerous, take my word for it. But her biggest moment comes when she implants a small amount of her power in each of her friends before she fulfills her prophecy. This not only saves them from Trigon's Earth-ending power, but this also gives her the strength to defeat her father for good. Raven admits that she fought evil in order to try and make up for the horrible deed that she was destined for, but thanks to the bond she formed with the team, she found hope in a brighter future, which thankfully became a reality. Next, we have Thunder and Lightning. At first, Thunder is seen alongside his brother, performing their role in nature, commanding storms from above. However, the two decide to come down to have fun. But their idea of fun was destroying a bridge with helpless people on it, which wasn't a good thing for them to do. However, Thunder does show honor and respect towards Beast Boy by saying that it's not sporty to attack an unready opponent, and he also clarifies that pain doesn't amuse him or his brother. After having a wake-up call from Beast Boy, Thunder realizes how wrong their actions are and convinces his brother that their way of fun is not right. In the end, the two apologize and make amends for their mistakes. Not to mention, the two also help the Titans out in the last fight with the Brotherhood of Evil. Up on the chalk block is Panther. This hero is quite the fighter, but she doesn't show much past her fighting capabilities. She does beat up Cyborg because he was tagged into the ring, and it does take a few minutes to realize that he just wants to give her a communicator so she can get some help if she needs it. And she does get upset when she finds out her friend, Wildebeest, is missing. But this doesn't last too long, since she goes right back to beating up the two guys in the ring. When the Titans are cut down to size, she almost leaves, since she thinks she'll be better off on her own. But thankfully, she agrees to stick around with a little help from Beast Boy. Overall, she does help take down a number of enemies in the battle against the Brotherhood of Evil, so she definitely has a heart of bravery and strength for doing what's right. At least when she's outside of the ring, anyway. Closing up the bottom of the barrel is Beast Boy. <laughs> Where to start with this kid? Well, for one, he's definitely the most immature of the team, as he's always cracking jokes, even at the worst of times. This also leads to him pulling pranks, such as the prank he pulls on Raven in the movie, or the prank that he tries to pull on Cyborg, which ends up with Starfire on the wrong end of the joke. For two, he is beyond clueless, and a whiner for someone who's supposed to be in his teens. He's impatient for treatment when he's sick, he'll complain about the cold weather, he'll complain about needing a vacation. He also gets the team stuck in the TV, where reality doesn't have to make sense, especially when Control Freak is running the show. But his biggest act of senselessness comes from what he did to Cyborg. Beast Boy removes all the firewalls and safety measures the tower has in place, just so he can download a bootleg game he really wanted to play. He then tries to play the game on what he thinks is Cyborg's computer, but he actually ends up corrupting his teammate's system recharger, which causes a powerful virus to enter Cyborg's body. This 
virus causes the poor guy to start destroying everything that he touches, so much so that he almost infects every machine in the entire city. When he decides to keep one of the mutants that Killer Moth made as a pet, he quickly pushes the creature onto Starfire after the tower is turned into a pigsty because of the little guy. He blames Cyborg for getting him involved in the fighting in the episode Go, even though the guy had nothing to do with Beast Boy's choices, and he also blames the half-robot for why the two of them are in Raven's room without her permission. His mouth also gets him in trouble with Galfor for calling the warrior a nanny, with Aqualad trying to be a show-off during their first time working together, and by the whole team when he takes more of an interest in the fake cyborg than the real one. His true anger is let out when Slade and Beast Boy's own dark side tell him that Terra wants nothing to do with him anymore. He also decides to go through Raven's things as a way to get inside her head. His most noble quality is, ironically, offering emotional support. He gives reassurance to Starfire when Robin goes missing. He supports Terra when she doesn't know how to fully control her powers and doesn't give up on her after she becomes a villain, going so far as to place a plaque below her statue that reads, Terra, a teen titan, a true friend. Despite the fact that he gives her a lot of grief, Beast Boy also provides Raven with a lot of comfort. A few examples of this behavior include being there for her after Malkior breaks her heart, telling her that he likes her when she thought he didn't, and also telling her that the whole team is happy that she was born, even if she isn't fond of the day herself. His heroic deeds go even further when he saves Raven from being attacked by Adonis in his out-of-control beast form, especially since Beast Boy attacked his friends just to keep Raven safe from harm. But the biggest case of his inner hero is his encounters with the brain. He not only destroys his ultimate weapon before the device can cause any harm, but he and Robin are able to stop the brain for good by the end of the final season. Overall, Beast Boy has made his mistakes, which have caused a number of problems for the team, and his attitude can make him hard to get along with. However, deep down, he's a good person who fights against evil for the sake of those closest to him. He's also willing to help his friends in combat, at home, or in their own heads, even when he's the one originally at fault for the problem. Next up on the list is none other than Cyborg. Cyborg's main flaws can be broken down into two clear categories. The first one is his sense of pride. In the episode Car Trouble, Cyborg lets his car take top priority over helping the city and becomes very protective of it, so much so that when the car is stolen by Gizmo, he helps the kid get away just to keep the car from crashing. Not to mention, he lashes out at his friends and scares a random teenager for information to get the car back. His pride issues are also seen in the episode Wavelength. It's made clear that Cyborg wants to settle the score with Brother Blood, which goes against the plan that the team made and causes his ego to act up. This only gets worse when he has to work with Bumblebee, who just beat him in combat. Being the tough fighter that he is, Cyborg hates the fact that he lost to a girl. This mere fact puts the whole mission in jeopardy, simply because he doesn't want to be anywhere near her as a result. The next is his anger management problems. When he first meets Beast Boy, he yells at him for his own monstrous appearance. Cyborg also acts angry at Robin when he fails to handle the weights during training, but this is simply due to Cyborg's frustration over his own limitations. This leaves him in a grumpy mood, which he unfortunately takes out on his friends when they try to help him feel better. He also jumps the gun with Robin in the episode Titans East Part 2, saying some nasty things to him, who deep down really cares about him and doesn't want to see him go. Getting into the minor flaws, Cyborg is very sarcastic, a bit insensitive to Beast Boy's dietary needs, and a teaser towards his friends, particularly Beast Boy. He does tease Robin about his feelings for Starfire, which causes its own conflict, but we're willing to forgive this deed since Starfire is not familiar with Cyborg's exact meaning behind the teasing comments. Moving on to a lighter note, Cyborg nearly eats a restaurant out of business, simply because they're an all-you-can-eat place. He's even willing to eat octopus and any other strange food, just so he can stay and eat more. This eventually leads to him being chased out of the restaurant, though saving their city from an enormous threat quickly gets him back on the chef's good side, hence the reward he presents for the hero. In addition to helping innocent citizens, Cyborg helps his team and allies during tough times, when he's able to keep his cool that is. 
He tries to help Narc adjust to technology, which plays a very important role when Dr. Light decides to kidnap Cole. Cyborg gives Narc the courage and tools to leave the underground and save Cole, which results in the three becoming good friends. But the most touching moment of help that he offers is to Starfire during the episode Troke. When Starfire gets upset about the word and its meaning, Cyborg immediately understands where she's coming from and informs Robin of the situation. Despite the many disagreements he has with the team, Cyborg cares about all of them and does what he can to be there for them even when there's conflict among the ranks such as when Beast Boy insults Raven for being so different than everyone else. This causes Cyborg to defend her and even follows the shapeshifter to her room in order to have him apologize properly. But he also does the same for Beast Boy as he tries to see if the green hero made it home alright after he loses his fight. Cyborg's most heroic actions are when he discovered how Slade was able to blackmail Robin onto his side and his fights against Brother Blood. The first one is accomplished by Cyborg studying Beast Boy blood to discover millions of tiny probes that could kill them within minutes. But despite learning this fact, the team is able to take down Slade and Cyborg is able to remove all the probes from their bodies. The second one is when Cyborg enrolls in the Hive Academy to discover their plans. He pulls off the bad guy routine so well that he had everyone fooled, but thankfully, he chose his friends over everything else he was offered. Despite the fact that he got his powers under dire circumstances and his noticeable faults, Cyborg does make the most out of the power he was given and does do a lot of good as a result. Will the Beast is next. He's first seen in the episode Winner Takes All, where he battles the Titan Boys in a tournament. However, this is a friendly competition that he takes with respect, even when Robin and Speedy decide to team up against him. Since he proved to be a noble hero, Robin makes him an honorary member of the Titans and gives him a communicator. Even though he's attacked later on in the series, he's more than willing to help the Titans take down the Brotherhood of Evil in the final battle, particularly against Madame Rouge. Up next is the True Master. This character only appears in the episode The Quest. In this episode, Robin travels across the globe to find an instructor to teach him how to improve his fighting capabilities. Though she doesn't say who she is and she has an attitude, she agrees to help him find the true master. In order to receive training, she secretly trains him and offers Robin gracious advice on the path to reach her doorstep. But what is most inspiring about the true master's character is the fact that she won't teach just anyone. She only only teaches those who have earned their keep and done their own work, hence why she doesn't teach Kataru while giving him the lecture of a lifetime before kicking him off the mountaintop. Since Robin had earned the right to train, the two begin the lesson after she gives him one more piece of advice. Don't take life so seriously. Next is Mechanic. This guy is only in one episode. He's basically the caretaker and coach of Atlas, which is shocking considering what we see of both of them. Unlike his supposed champion, this guy believes in fairness, support, and good motivation to keep his champion going. He's constantly complimenting Atlas, giving him advice, offers encouragement during his fights, and even defends him when others disrespect him. Not to mention, he also fixes him, fetches oil, keeps him clean, and takes care of all his weapons. Weapons. All in all, if he was a trainer to anyone else, this guy would definitely have a real champion on his side. His only downside is that he works for a villain, but thanks to some clarity from Robin, he's able to break free from his so-called champion's grip and find a true winner to support. Up next is Jericho. This hero is only seen in the last few episodes of the series, where the Titans are battling the Brotherhood of Evil, which is actually why he's put where he is on the list. However, he does deserve his spot. When he isn't fighting bad guys, Jericho lives on top of a mountain in harmony with nature. When Beast Boy shows up to give him a communicator, complaining and tired, Jericho simply listens, smiles, and pats Beast Boy on the head after he collapses. This hero is also one of the only targeted heroes to survive the ambush. So, he's more than willing to lend a hand to the other titans that need his help. Given the fact that this hero can possess anyone who stares into his eyes, he 
uses his powers to find where the Brotherhood of Evil is hiding and uses it to his advantage on the battlefield, as we see him hop from villain to villain during the fight. Sadly, there's not much more information to cover on this character, so we'll leave it at that. Up next is Harold. Unlike a lot of the minor heroes, this guy actually has a lot under his rap sheet. In his first appearance, he jumps in to help Raven from getting attacked by a creature in his dimension. Then, after he survives his ambush, he brings Jericho to the emergency base with him. But his most heroic actions come from the final fight. With help from Mos, he defeats Adonis in Punk Rocket and holds his own against Mammoth, Mumbo Jumbo, and several other villains. In addition, he defends Timmy, Teether, and Melvin from Malkior, and he uses his powers to send a giant explosive device into space to save everyone in the Brotherhood of Evil's lair from certain doom. And to think, he almost didn't participate in the fight at all. I guess Beast Boy's pep talk struck a chord with him. The leader of the Titans is next on the chopping block. Robin has less marks against him than his other teammates. Unfortunately, he's not without his faults. For one, he is arrogant, which leads him to placing blame on others, like he did with Cyborg. Because of this, Cyborg quits, and although Robin treats losing a teammate as no big deal at the start, he soon realizes how much he misses Cyborg and wants to apologize to him. On other occasions, he acts cold and distant, such as when he's tracking down Slade or handling other villains. And on the topic of Slade, Robin shows his worst side whenever the villain is mentioned. In fact, the team becomes so obsessed with him that he resorts to being a criminal just to get closer to him. He steals, lies, and even attacks his own friends while under the cover of Red X, using his knowledge of their powers to incapacitate them. He lashes out at everyone, including Starfire, when he thinks that she lets Slade get away. He goes so far as to turn on his friends in desperation, which is why he has to be restrained when he's examined at Titan's Tower. Whenever things go wrong during a mission, or when he's too late to help someone in need, Robin is quick to blame himself for why the situation happened. This is the case when he breaks his arm fighting Johnny Rancid, when Wildebeest is nowhere to be found after trying to call for help, and for his own suit falling into the hands of the current Red X. In the episode Sisters, Robin gives Starfire comfort when she's having doubts about her own abilities, compared to Blackfire's. In the episode Only Human, he confronts Cyborg about his insecurities of being half-human, and he gives Mechanic the strength to stand up for himself. When he first meets Raven, it's clear that she doesn't think highly of herself, but he tells her that he knows enough about her to know what kind of person she is, and this makes her feel better. Robin is also the first one to find out why Raven hates her birthday and tries to assure her that everything will be alright in the end, which turns out to be true. Robin's best quality is the belief he has in his friends, and the determination to help them out in whatever jam they happen to get into, which is a huge step forward to how he was in the beginning. One more important note to mention is how respectful Robin can be of boundaries. He respects Raven's wish to be alone, so much so that he even has to physically stop Starfire from bothering her. Also, we can't forget to mention that he was willing to go on a date with Kitten to stop a criminal from destroying the city. And even in the movie, Robin may be marked as a criminal, but he does end up saving the city from a horrible threat that, ironically, was in charge of the police force that was supposed to be protecting the city. He definitely has marks against him, but for the most part, he makes a worthy leader to the Titans. Let's talk about Kid Flash next. For starters, this guy doesn't take his battles with a high five too seriously. He gives Giz Gizmo the boot out of an electric store, he nets five goals in an ice hockey game when taking down Billy Numerous, and he even gives Kid Wicked and Seymour a run for their money. He tears their evil lair apart as he runs around the place, all the while letting the team use their powers to his advantage. He has no sense of privacy as he goes through Jinx's personal artwork without her permission. His most disputed action, however, is his interactions with Jinx. Instead of taking her to jail after stopping her team from trying to rob a museum, him, he makes it clear that he just wants to talk to her first. But this actually works out, since he convinces her that she's better than the villain life, which does turn her into an ally for the final fight. His biggest heroic deed, however, is bringing the fallen villains to the twins to freeze, which improved the hero's chances for victory in a very noticeable way. If it wasn't for this act alone, then his placement would probably be much higher than it is. Next up, we have the kids, Melvin, Timmy, and Teether. These kids first appear in the episode Hide and Seek, which is where most of their actions come into play. Out of all these smaller heroes, Timmy is the most problematic, since he throws a fit 
every chance he gets. However, we see by the end of the episode that Timmy's tantrums can cause sound waves that help to stop Mala, so that is definitely a plus on his part. Second one up is Teether, whose only bad moment comes from when he pukes on Raven, though he is a baby, so this is kind of understandable. Teether tends to chew on things that a typical baby would normally not be allowed to touch. He chews on chairs, shoes, rubber, and even metal, but this turns out to be a good thing, since he saves the team from Mala by eating a cable cord during their snow lift ride, and also by biting his metal holding, turning the chewed up pieces into makeshift bullets. Finally, we have Melvin, who seems to be the leader of the group. For the most part, she's easy to handle and gives Raven advice on how to help the rest of her team stay out of trouble. However, in the final fight, it's revealed that Melvin can bring her imaginary friends to life like Bobby, who saves the team and Raven from Mala. By the end, the whole group grows attached to Raven, as their powers are shown through their urge to protect her, as well as their actions toward her. Timmy uses his blanket on Raven when she gets knocked out, Teether gives Raven his pacifier, and Melvin explained that Bobby was scared of Raven at first, but he grew to like her. These kids may have started off on the wrong foot, but despite their young age, they act like true heroes, especially since they offered a helping hand in the final fight with the Brotherhood of Evil. Now we have Larry. This little guy is Robin from an alternate dimension, who wants to help his other half after his hero's fight with Johnny Rancid ends in defeat. He's bubbly, cheery, and gets very caught up in his excitement, hence the mess he made in the tower when he first arrived. Though he does have magical powers, he doesn't appear to have good control over them since when he tries to fix Robin's arm, things don't go so well. Furthermore, he's quite annoying and constantly bothers Robin about fixing his arm but his efforts to help are most effective in another way. He fixes Robin's bike, helps him in the rematch against Rancid, and he has complete faith in Robin, which helps the teen finally gain confidence in himself to defeat the villain. Despite his overall character, his heartfelt words and good intentions are what place him so high on the list. So if Larry is Robin and he offered him confidence in himself, does that mean he inspired himself while talking to himself? Oh my god, my head hurts. The last main character we're gonna to discuss is Starfire. Honestly, we only see Starfire at her worst in like two episodes. In one of those episodes, Starfire is new to Earth and on her guard after escaping captivity on an alien ship, so we can't really blame her for lashing out or being violent, especially since she doesn't even speak English yet. We even get a look into how Starfire was raised in a later episode. When we visit her home planet, she does revert back to her traditional ways at her wedding feast, surrounded by her own kind. However, this is very sparingly, as she explains that she now views Earth as her home, and therefore adapts back to the manners that her new life has taught her. In the other episode, we see a hostile side of Starfire that we haven't seen since her first appearance. She's violent as she destroys a limo, she lashes out at a couple simply wanting some punch, and she has no problem letting her jealousy show in full as she attacks both Fang and Kitten. There's also the case in which Starfire has to battle her inner demon. This is an encounter where her dark side acts completely on its own, so we can't really blame her for not being able to control herself. Despite all these flaws and insecurities, Starfire has the biggest heart among the Titans. She's very apologetic whenever she does something wrong, and does not like to fight her friends or to hear them fighting each other. This was made clear when she traveled to the future and fought desperately for the team to be reunited again. Her most admirable quality, though, is her ability to compromise and do the right thing, no matter how difficult the situation is. In addition, her quick thinking stops a bomb from going off in the middle of the fight between good and evil, ultimately letting the battle be won. Starfire may have her moments when she can seem harsh or scary, but deep down, she's a loyal friend and a hero who will do anything to help those in need with respect and determination. Coming up next on the list is Cole and Nark. Since these two heroes battle as a team and are extremely close, we're going to put both of them in the same spot. Cole is very friendly, trusting, generous, and cheerful. She has a kind heart and a very patient demeanor, especially towards Nark. 
The two save the Titans from getting eaten by raptors. Then they invite the team over for dinner and offer to help stop Dr. Light. Because of her power to crystallize herself, Cole made the decision to live underground so no one can use her powers for their own gain, which is exactly what Dr. Light tries to achieve. Now let's touch on the second part of this duo. Narc is basically a caveman. He gets scared of technology and strangers, so he does tend to lash out at both. He's also jealous of Cyborg, as he's scared of Cole wanting to go back to the surface. Though by the end of the episode, he puts his fears aside to save Cole from Dr. Light and destroy his machine, and he also warms up to the team, particularly Cyborg, who gave him confidence in himself to overcome his fears. Narc may let his emotions get the better of him, but with Cole fighting alongside him, the two make a courageous and inspiring team who put quite the fight against the Brotherhood of Evil. Moving on to the most heroic of the list, we have Red Star. This guy has a lot of good to give. But first, let's add some context. He was involved in a military experiment whose goal was to create the perfect soldier. However, this experiment proved to be a failure, since radiation released from his body destroyed his entire town and left very few survivors. Even though this event was tragic, he can't be blamed for it, since he didn't know the full side effects to the experiment, nor did he intend the horrific outcome of the test. Yet, the town still treats him like a monster, which he has proven to be anything but. In his first episode, he frees a bear from a trap tries to warn a group of hunters to stay away from him since he doesn't want to hurt anyone, and he even saves Starfire from freezing to death in a snowstorm. In fact, this radiation causes a dangerous creature to be born that shot down the Titan ship and attacked the team. At first, Red Star takes the blame for the crime personally, since he can't always control himself during his outburst. This is why he chooses to isolate himself, so no one can get hurt. However, this creature was actually created from a leakage in Red Star's hideout that he was unaware of. So again, can't really fault him, but he chooses to take the blame anyway and destroy the creature once and for all. Furthermore, he chooses to fight the being alone since he doesn't want any harm to come to anyone else. When the radiation in his body threatens to overspill, he tells Starfire to take him away from the scene to release the massive energy to prevent disaster. His only other appearance is during the final fight between the Brotherhood of Evil and the Titans, where he helps to protect his friends. His only real flaw is his hesitation towards returning to the town in order to stop the creature. But again, can we really blame him? If his town blames him to the point where they call him an abomination, we seriously doubt that anyone would be too willing to go back. Next, let's talk about Starfire's people, particularly her guardian Galfor. At first, Galfor is intimidating and scary. However, his true character is revealed as the episode goes on. He cares about Starfire's well-being both physically and mentally, which is why he tells her to do what's best in her heart and why he growls at her groom when the two finally meet. Galfor also cares for his people, as he wishes he could do something about the Drenthax invasion that threatens his home. But since he doesn't have the authority to make such a decision, this causes him deep frustration. And though they respect Starfire, since Blackfire is ruler of the planet, the people have to obey her, even when her actions are not ethical. However, when Starfire wins the crown from Blackfire and claims that she's not right for Tamaran, the planet cheers and is happy for her decision to make Galfor the leader. Since Tamaranians live by their emotions, her people respect Starfire's wishes, which offers a clear sense of empathy between all the people on the planet. All hail Galfor. Up next is Sarasim and her people. Being the main hero in the episode Cyborg the Barbarian, she earned her spot on this list. She leads her people to battle and has their backs during the fight. She defends Cyborg, and even after she's attacked, the only thing she asks of him in return is for him to join the fight. She and her people are thankful for herself, and they welcome him as a guest. In addition, they give him permission to help himself to anything he needs. Her worry for her people is great, and she fights to ensure they remain safe and she's even willing to go into battle without armor or an actual weapon. What a woman. In addition, she wants to honor Cyborg for their victory. Furthermore, she's not the only noble one in her tribe. A fellow warrior gives Cyborg a weapon when his own strength isn't enough. They know that the fight may end their lives, but they're still willing to face the danger. Incredibly, she and her people pull Cyborg out of the river and recreate Cyborg's prototype invention to bring him back online. 
The most touching part is the fact that she thought so much of him that he was preserved in history as one of their greatest allies. Coming up next, we have the twins, Mos and Menos. All right, since the writer of the script doesn't know how to speak Spanish, we're gonna go based on body language and context clues. These two are often seen as the cheerful and helpful members of Titan Zeus. They help Bumblebee build the tower, take care of Silky, give a massive lecture on how bad the team's performance in battle was, and act friendly towards Cyborg, to the extent that they didn't want him to leave once his work was done. The two are helpful in disasters, as they protect the train from trouble, shut off Control Freak's machine in time, and help the Titans in the final fight between the heroes and the villains. Mo shows a lot of effort in helping by playing a decoy to lure an enemy to the rest of the team, using his twin connection to guide the group onwards, and even escaping custody in order to free his brother from captivity. The two then work together to defeat Professor Chang and unfreeze all the heroes while freezing all the villains. This gives them huge points during the final battle. That being said, these two can have a few downsides as well. The two make fun of Speedy on occasion. Their excitement can cause problems, such as when a paint can falls on Speedy's head and the two are even seen fighting over Starfire at one point. <laughs> oh, brother. Our next hero is Aqualad. We first meet Aqualad in the episode Deep Six, when he's trying to catch a criminal named Triton. When he sees the Titans in trouble, he offers a hand by saving the Titans from drowning and taking their ship to Tram for repairs. He's also willing to chase down Triton alone, but ultimately accepts Beast Boy's help. The two do get off on the wrong foot, mainly due to Beast Boy's jealousy. After the fight, he's thankful to have allies on the surface that he can trust. This is also the case when Brother Blood decides to make his new academy in the ocean, which calls on Aqualad to ask the Titans for help. He protects Steel City and the Titans' home when he's called to do so, and he even joins in the final fight against the Brotherhood of Evil in order to put an end to the General. He's a polite, humble, and good-natured hero who would help anyone in need, regardless of the risk, as seen in his encounter with Control Freak. Just be careful if you eat seafood around him, he might throw a fit about his friends getting eaten. Second on the good guy countdown is Hotspot. When he's first introduced, we're told that he has a bad temper. But as far as we've seen, he's actually a very chill guy. He accepts the role of stopping criminals, but has no real interest in hurting anyone. Even when he chases down a thief and runs into Madame Rouge for the first time, he's hesitant to attack her and doesn't want to fight her if he doesn't have to. Thankfully, since his body temperature is too hot for her to grab him, she can't really hurt him without getting burned. Even when she tries to fool him by turning into Robin, he claims that he likes being a Titan and wants his powers active so he's ready for a fight at all times. And this almost succeeds until she leads him to an oil plant. After he finds out her plan, he breaks his communicator, so she can't use it to track down the other Titans. And even though he attacks the real Robin later on in the fight, we can't really blame him since Madame Rouge has been messing with his head for most of the day. And finally, our gold medal for the purest hero goes to Tram. He may speak gibberish, but from his body language, he's more than eager to help the Titans when their ship needs to be repaired. In addition, he rushes to help Aqualad when Robin calls him to battle. Even though he lost his match, Tram still offers a helping hand, especially during the final fight as he and the Atlanteans splash onto the scene. The thing that is most endearing about Tram is the fact that he's quite capable of fighting. However, he only seems to fight when he absolutely has to, which usually falls under the category of protecting those closest to him. All right, time to hear from you guys. Is there a hero we should have placed differently? Why should their placement be changed? And was there a placement that you are not expecting on this list? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, stay wicked.